Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Ben and Brand See a Movie Presents The Wild Wild West, where we explore all the eccentricities and excitement that comes with Wes Anderson films. And we are on our fourth Wes Anderson film, and maybe to some his most divisive, but also to many others his most beloved. We are talking The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. And with me is my co host for this season, Jalal Amat. Happy to be back, Ben. Yeah, I'm happy to have you back. And I'm excited to be talking about this movie with you specifically. Uh, This is a very unique movie, and it's one that I watched years ago and remember not liking. And not to say that my opinion hasn't changed a lot, but my opinion has changed a lot on this movie. So I'm really excited to get into this one because I think it's just such a unique and interesting movie. Yeah, I was coming into it as a first-time viewer, and uh, it was something. Yeah. <laughs> it was definitely something. Yeah, and this movie, for everyone who's watching along, this movie is on Hulu right now, so you can check it out on Hulu. And the coolest thing going on right now, of course, is we have our March Madness Wes Anderson bracket. And I'm blown away by what's going on. We've already received 500 votes in one day of our uh ongoing polls and there is an upset that i cannot believe that is in the makings right now and when you guys hear this episode you'll figure it out if the upset has already happened by this because you won't be hearing this until tuesday right now the number one seed royal tenenbaum is losing to the number 16 seed agatha from grand budapest hotel played by sarcy ronan that really is a giant that is literally i could not believe the numbers i'll admit it my bracket screwed if that goes out in the first round, I can. Hey, well, we're doing March Mammal Madness yeah. with the kids at my school, and uh, my bracket has been tossed out is, by now. It's been like one round. Was <laughs> the monkey already, like, in there? Lost. Monkeys were definitely in there. How's the monkey doing? We haven't gotten there yet. Oh, okay, that's good. Hasn't that's... had its time to shine yet. <laughs> yeah, I when I saw this because I looked at it last night, or I should say, this is currently Saturday when we're recording. When I looked at it last night after the first twenty four hours, I was blown away i'm like wait what's happening and then i looked at like all the polling and all the voting because you can vote on into the beniverse.com my instagram i have a google forms on the subreddit wes anderson subreddit all that stuff and it, the links are everywhere guys so if you follow me you'll find the links i calculate i was calculating the votes just to get an idea of what was going on and when i saw that i was amazed so i mean that's already crazy and we're talking about a movie today with Life Aquatic Steve Zissou, where Steve Zissou is also the number one seed, and he is competing, I believe it is Sunday, against Albert Henkels, who's in the Grand Budapest Hotel, so I'm curious to see how that matchup favors. I have a feeling Steve Zissou is going to come out ahead based on the popularity of this movie, but we never know, because I would have said the exact same thing about Royal Tenenbaum, so apparently... I don't know what you guys like in Wes Anderson films. Uh, Jalal, with that all said, I think we should just get into the story of this movie. And I'm going to kick it off with the film historian uh, view of this movie. Are you ready to dive in? Let's do it. Let's dive right into The Life Aquatic. The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou is a 2004 American comedy drama directed and written by Wes Anderson. What's also very unique about this film is this is the first film that Owen Wilson does not co-write alongside Wes Anderson. This one is actually co-written by Noah Baumbach, who's a director who would go on to have a pretty famous career himself as a director. He directed The Squid and the Whale. He directed a movie in 2017 called The Meyerowitz Stories, which I'm actually quite fond of. And maybe most recently, all you know him from Marriage Story with Adam Driver and Scarlett Johansson. But this is one of his earliest features with Wes Anderson. They would go on again to work in Fantastic Mr. Fox. But they co-wrote this film together. It is the fourth feature film directed by Wes Anderson. It came out December 25th, 2004. I'll just mention a few things. This film comes out a year after Bill Murray has his huge film lost in translation which a lot of people said he should have won the oscar for he gets nominated but loses out owen wilson you know is the big comedy star Kate blanchett's also in a very 
finite stage in her career. This is a few years after the uh, film Elizabeth, which is, of course, one of the big films that makes her famous in 1997. She had had work since then, but she doesn't have maybe as much of a definitive role. She actually has a huge year with 2004, not only with this film, but more of note, The Aviator, directed by Martin Scorsese, where I believe she wins her first Academy Award in that film. So she has a really big 2004 release. And The Life Aquatic, despite being a very beloved film to some, it's a very divisive film, especially when it came out with critics. It, it received mixed reviews, and it was a box office flop. It grossed, and I could not believe this number uh, when I saw it, it had a budget of $50 million, and now with it being released, you know, approximately 20 years later, it's now said to have grossed about $34 million, which is a bomb on all accounts. It's Wes Anderson's first huge financial disappointment. Kind of shocking considering this comes straight out of a few years after Royal Tenenbaums is one of the biggest indie films of the 21st century to come out. But... This film went on to then have a positive reception from uh, fans and has been seen as a cult classic and a beloved film within the West Anderson filmography. And that's where we're just going to start from there. Let's just talk about this movie. Jalal, what was your experience watching this movie for the first time? Well, I will tell you, I did not know what was going to happen. <laughs> I, I guess I was just not really paying attention and missing signs, but... Uh, Ending caught me off guard for sure. Um, am I allowed to talk about it? <laughs> yeah, th and obviously, as always, spoilers galore, and we're not going to have really any real structure to this movie, so let's just jump into it. Jalal, yeah. that ending surprised you? Yeah, that ending really, really caught me off guard. I uh, I wasn't sure what to expect between Ned and uh, Zisu's relationship, you know, coming to a head toward the end of the movie. I, I didn't see a helicopter crash <laughs> yeah, coming. And I, you know, actually a lot of the movie I didn't really see coming. I didn't see the pirates coming. I didn't see Bill Murray <laughs> engaging in a firefight <laughs> coming. Multiple firefights. It's one of my favorite elements of the movie is the firefights. Yeah, I didn't see a three-legged dog coming and then getting left behind on with his original owners, to be entirely fair. <laughs> Though, in fairness, all of them are shot. Most of them. <laughs> yeah. So There's the th kid that they left that's going to get yeah, the, so th the cap Hopefully the, the dog gets treated well. <laughs> hopefully. The kid seems nice, you know? Yeah. The, what, one I, glance, one smile. Yeah. It's weird. I had seen this film before, and I remembered chunks of this film. I could not say I remembered most of this film while watching it, where I'm just like, okay, I remember these characters. Willem Dafoe stood out in my memory specifically. I remembered the whole thing with uh the whole chase about the shark like i remember the really central points of it and i remember this dynamic between ned between steve and between kate or sorry jane so i remembered like aspects of that i did not remember ned plimpton died in this movie i did not remember how sad this movie was that's what threw me off where i'm just like wow i remember this being way more eccentric comedy than yeah. I recalled. Yeah, I think the first act of the movie really leads you to believe that it's going to be a fun, happy time. Because I remember the first 10 minutes I was watching it, and I was like, oh, so it's going to be like kind of a dry comedy. That's fun. Because mm. um, yeah, the opening of the scene of the movie is him in the film festival and like debuting his um, his part one of the movie. And then it just kind of delves into wow, this guy's life is sad. He openly calls himself, like, depressed and no one likes him. Mm -hmm. So it uh, it definitely took a turn. Um, I don't really know if it was for the better or for the worse. I think I was... I think I was strapped in expecting definitely more, like, a 70-30 comedy to drama. And I was uh, definitely taken aback when it was flipped around <laughs> that way. It... It's funny because we kind of had some of those disagreements and opposite views on Rushmore, and I'm kind of playing the opposite against you again. For me, and this is my hill to die on, I'll just mention it now. For me, the parts where it's kind of just a parody off Jacques Cousteau and making fun of that whole oceanography culture, Cousteau. that's the part of... Yeah, Cousteau. 
I I watched Pinky and the Brain and they have a character that's called what I said. So that explains it where I've, I've never actually read any of Cousteau's work. Neither have I. Yeah, that shows how great college students we were. But we got, we passed really well. So. I wasn't an English major. I wasn't supposed to read that. <laughs> was that it? Was he considered English? I would have figured he was a science guy. Like you would read him I in science. Of? Oh, I'm thinking of, for whatever reason, I'm thinking of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. That I actually yeah, did. I read one of those illustrated classics versions of that. I did. I, was like I read the grade. exact same book in fifth grade. Yeah. <laughs> was the illustrated classic. I never read the real one. Is that Julius Irving? Is that his name? Jules Verne. That that's it. Thank you. Thank you. With this movie, for me, if it had remained this really weird, like eccentric look into oceanography, the comedy to me is funny, but it doesn't hold the movie. It's when the movie goes deeper into the dramas where I connected with this movie and actually ended up quite enjoying it. Oh, no, I'm not saying I didn't enjoy it. I definitely mm-hmm. did enjoy the dramatic parts. I just wasn't quite ready for them. <laughs> like, yeah. I, th- I was expecting one thing and got something pretty different. Yeah, because for me... It didn't th- hurt my enjoyment of the movie. It just mm-hmm. did... I had to adjust my view of things. Yeah. yeah. For me, at the beginning when I was watching it, I actually was not into it. Just I, the comedy to me, it was just like it was kind of hit or miss at times. There were characters that worked really well. I think one of the standout characters in this movie is Kloss, played by Willem Dafoe. Oh, I think absolutely. the whole He's... look of him is yeah, just really great. funny. I The choice to just put him in shorts while everyone else is just in like their normal like sweatpants outfits. And he's just in these ridiculously short red p- shorts. Oh that my God. whole character worked for me really well. Oh, I had this pulled up. I don't remember uh, what award um, not or committee it was, but they actually, the costume designer for this won some kind of award for costume design, which I completely agree with because every single one of them was very, uh, they all it popped It was the Costume the Designers Guild Awards. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> there one. you go. <laughs> yeah. It won Costume Designers Guild Award for excellence in costume designs for a contemporary film. Well, this film was contemporary, and the costumes yeah, it, were pretty interesting. So Yes, there's a very distinct choice to the costuming, and there's really just a distinct choice to everything made in this film. What worked for me not only was a, fun, a few of these really fun characters that we dove into, what worked is once we started learning more about Ned, because I think Ned's character allows us to explore Steve in a way that's extremely more complex and it's all for the better absolutely yeah let's just kind of jump into some of the beats of this film so this film follows steve zissou who is chasing down a is it a jaguar shark i believe is jaguar what it's called. shark it is it's a jaguar shark that ends up killing somebody who is basically like a friend slash father figure to Zissou. So his whole plot of this film is him chasing down the shark to kill it with dynamite. Sound like another ma- massive literary work to you? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Exactly. <laughs> it's like it's very clearly an homage to Moby Dick. Very clearly one that they set up right at the beginning. And like I said, it's working for me. Like I get like that's a fairly funny premise. But at the beginning, there's just something, maybe it's just, it's something I'm so used to being, not having with Bill Murray, where I just wasn't liking that character, which is a weird thing for Bill Murray, because even the unlikable characters, I like it because it's Bill Murray. This one to me was so strongly dislikable. He was crossing a lot of lines throughout the entire movie. Yeah. uh, he doesn't treat people very well in general, so it's he was pretty unlikable yeah, overall. But, and at, at the beginning of the film, I felt like they weren't paying... Uh, there was an admiration that people had towards this character and maybe a sense of just like letting him get away with it. And I don't think it's till Ned really comes into the film and we learn more about that character, who he is, and he starts having relations with other crew members that you really get some of the darker tendencies of of Steve Zissou explored. Because 
for the beginning of the film, I'm just like, Steve's going to be this character who kind of just gets to act this way. And I don't actually see it having major repercussions. What I like that this film does is it allows that character to move. It allows, sorry, that character of Steve to transform before our eyes in a very organic way. Oh, yeah. Watching his arc throughout the movie, um, especially his uh, his visit to Eleanor and eventual apology to her without having, you know, actually saying the words, I'm sorry. It was actually really refreshing to see that character make those steps and come out as a better person in the end. It's one of those things when watching this film, I was just kind of shocked, I think is the best word, to see a character that is so unlikable portrayed in a film and very much be the protagonist. He's not the antagonist of this story. Like, no one's going against him. He is just the character we're following. And Wes Anderson does it in such an interesting way with Steve where you never quite feel pity for him until the end of the film, which usually they always... A lot of filmmakers will have a moment at the very beginning to give us like a sense of like, oh, well, this is what this character's go th- going through. So we have a little bit to like hold on to and maybe see those moments of humanity. This one we don't like the whole premise of his friend dying. Like, yes, well, the, a friend dying is going to affect a friend, the, the people they leave behind, I should say. It's never enough. It was a plot to, device. <laughs> yeah, it, it never was. gets you enough to actually like sympathize for this character. No, it's because he doesn't show really any emotion or remorse toward the situation. It's just very matter of fact, which is very similar to what his character was in a Rushmore. The cadence of his speech is what I'm talking mostly about. That very, uh, not, I'm not going to say nonchalant, but that very um, uncaring tone. So it... You don't really feel any unhappiness that his best friend died because he's not really showing it. Well, he does show it at one point in the movie. Like, the emotion from that situation comes out, but when it's first introduced, it is more of a comedic thing than it is like, a, oh my god, my friend died and my world outlook has changed. And it's it was set up to be a comedic beat. So. Yeah, and there's, I think, bringing up Herman J. Bloom, who is... Bill Murray's character in Rushmore was an interesting beak that I also wanted to talk about. I think the difference between those two characters, sorry, those two characters is one of them is much more malicious. (laughs) Yeah. Incredibly relatable, but also I think Zizu is much more malicious. Oh yeah. He was in the pain. He causes other people. Yeah. He actively took advantage of the fact that Ned wanted to make a connection with him to fund his movie when he was running out of money. He was like, I'm going to pay you back. And he, fully believed that he was going to pay him back but it did still feel like he was kind of not twisting his arm about it but just nudging him in that direction yeah and with that i think what zisu also has as a character going for him is there is this sense that when you watch the movie he is dealing with maybe who he is as a person and as a not an entertainer, but what his legacy will be because he's struggling with the fact that he's getting older and he's struggling to believe that his life hasn't really had meaning up until this point. Yeah. I think uh, one line that captures that feeling is his, uh, when people are telling me to get out of the business, he's like, I'm only 50. And when you look at him, he, what else does he have besides oceanography? Because once again, his marriage is falling apart. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's it's that interesting thing where with Wes Anderson, you know, I was reading a bit about him after watching this movie because I'm like, okay. Is it in that book that you're giving away as a, oh no, my it's God, not a in plug that book. for Wes, Wild Wild West? It is not in that book at all. I was just reading about it online because, you know, after watching Rushmore, which deals with uh, death of a parent for Max Fisher's character, Royal Tenenbaums, the Royal and Agatha are divorced in that film. And then in this movie, their marriage is breaking up. There's obviously something going on to why Wes is drawn to characters like this. And it makes sense. His parents divorced at the age of eight. So he's writing on something he knows and probably emotions that he's been able to draw on since his childhood. 
and yeah, which always which is always good because he does make those issues feel very real in his films because they c- come from such a personal place exactly and that's what i liked with this movie is their relationship isn't at the point of just pure bitterness or resentment even to like where herman j bloom's character is in rushmore it's almost now just indifference where it's just like they feel like stuck and there's no real change because Zisu is incapable himself of really making a change. Yeah, and I think um, his arc reflects that. He was basically doing the exact same thing from his, well, I mean, from his entire life he's been doing using the same crew, the same boat, the same equipment. Like the whole joke is that his boat is completely falling apart around them and ultimately the shitty equipment, sorry, is what got Ned killed. So in a way that kind of reflects his inability to make changes. And from that point on, he he does. Well, I mean, he starts treating people better before Ned dies, thank God. Mm-hmm. But it is that relationship, that bringing new life into, his, into him that like enabled him to make that change. You're correct. And I think another thing that reflects this is the, um, the flag design. You know, when... Uh, Ned brings up the fact that their insignia hasn't changed at all in the last, like, however long they've been doing this, like 30 years or whatever. And once he brings it up, he's just like, may, yeah, maybe. Take a crack at Mm -hmm. it. Go for it. Yeah. There's certain things to the set design throughout that really just kind of show who Steve Zissou is in the public eye. One of them being a really easy trick that they do right at the beginning, where when Steve is watching old clips of his show slash films on like a little TV. It's literally on a pedestal, which is just like such an easy device to just put a characters on where that's like him oh, looking at himself a on a pedestal. Detail. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, that's where the brilliance of Wes Anderson comes in where it's just like, it's not all in the writing. Some of it, you just get through the production design. I've always talked about films where I would, I always tell young filmmakers to like watch towards, for instance, when we watched the film seven, a few months ago on the podcast, I remember Branson and I were talking like, if you want to learn how to move a camera or how to create tension by just cinematography, all of that and editing, look at this for me, what Wes Anderson does so well as a director, it's how do you convey emotion through the settings and the background and the atmosphere created. One of the elements of this film that I love so much is you can tell this ship is practical. Oh, this is not CGI. No, I love that. The set design and the color palette and everything just popped. It was such a, and not to mention all the claymation animals that were just adorable and gorgeous and i love this little magical world that they live in because it's the ocean a lot of it is quote-unquote unexplored i don't know if that's true or not anymore but (laughs) who knows what kind of silly creatures will be lurking around and i love that it was taken to that and i love that they used claymation and back to the set design everything looked so cool and definitely a treat for the eyes Rewatching this movie and the royal tenenbaums recently The one thing I will note about the set design in this movie that I have a little bit of issues where I think Royal Tenenbaums does it so well is in Royal Tenenbaums, the house is so perfectly constructed that you know exactly every room and where every scene is taking place within that house. This boat's a little too big for its own good where you just kind of feel like, is the correct term, would it be like a MacGuffin almost where it's just like, there can be scenes that happen and you're just like, well, this just seems like a room that was just conveniently there that we've never actually seen. I don't know if that's a MacGuffin, but I see what you're saying. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong, honestly. (laughs) I don't remember how you use that word. Regardless, that was one of my issues when watching the movie where I'm just like, sometimes it just does feel like rooms come out of appearance, like not come out of appearance, but just come out of of nowhere. It's just another like, oh, look, another part of the boat. Yeah, because the boat's so big that you're allowed to do that. And I get that he's allowed to do that. It does just make the boat a little bit of a plot device at times where it's just like, oh, we need these characters in this type of room. Of course, this boat's going to have this type of room. But it's like we didn't actually set up that this boat has that anytime before. 
I'm trying to think of a scene specifically. I think there's just a scene where they're all just sitting around and it's just they're all chilling. I, oh, it's the scene where they are about to they're talking about uh, it's day 24 mutiny and oh, they're yeah, all yeah. just sitting in this room and it's like, oh, well, this seems to be like a break room. But like, where did this come from and where exactly is this in the boat? Like no. that it's it's details like that where I'm just like, I don't mind it because, again, it's a big boat. So I understand it's stuff like that that I did wish was a little bit tighter. And I think you could have made it a little bit more atmospheric if the boat's just a little bit smaller. I see what you're saying. Uh, me, to me personally, it didn't affect my uh, enjoyment at all. A lot of it was because I didn't really notice it. I, mm. <laughs> I was basically a lot more... Uh, a lot more impressed with how storybooky a lot of it was when he's going through parts of the boat earlier in the movie. He, uh, basically every single way a character would pose looked like it would be straight out of a storybook, like that whole set and everything, and I thought it was just really charming. So I guess I was just pretty taken by that. That moment you talk about is one of my favorite moments, too. It's where he's walking, him and I believe it's Ned are walking up the boat, and they're just going room to room to room with different characters kind of in the background doing their things, correct? Yeah, yeah. That is awesome cinematography and camera work where it's just following those characters so naturally as you go from one floor to the floor above it to the floor to its right, all that. That was the scene where I'm just like, wow, this is just kind of amazing set design that, again, you can only get if you have a practical effect of a boat actually being there built where you get to rig the camera in a way that follows it naturally. Otherwise, you get this kind of weird green screen that none of the rooms feel really attached to each other, and it kind of gives it this weightless feeling where it's just like, oh, okay, well, there's no like connection to all these rooms. They're just rooms. Yeah, they could just be rooms in any building, not even a boat. Yeah. No, but yeah. this actually felt like you're going through some cozy, worn-in sea vessel. Yeah, exactly. That's that's. I totally agree with you. Let's jump a little bit a little bit back into the movie this is a tendency and we're going to talk about it way more Joel when we get a little bit later into Wes Anderson's filmography where there is an excess of characters and sometimes it works really well where each character kind of has their personalities I'm thinking of a Grand Budapest Hotel that does it quite well versus maybe a French Dispatch where it's just like there's a lot of characters in this film Really, only four or five are memorable. This film, The Life Aquatic, is kind of right in the middle for me. Where it's like, there is a lot of characters in this film. And I think for the most part, they're more memorable than not. But there are certainly cast members in this film that's just like, oh, they are here to kind of just fill out the crew and maybe have their one or two scenes. But they're not really a part of this film. Oh yeah, like the way. um, like Vikram, the camera operator, and the synth player, more particularly than the guitar player, who had a you know a lot more scenes. Just yeah, I do like uh the the guitar player is the character's name is Pelly, who is a number sixteen seed in the tournament, played by Se Sad George, I believe is his name. Mm. The reason I put him on because I'm like okay, that's a pretty minor role. I do just love the soundtrack and music to this movie. I think his David Bowie German covers are absolutely beautiful and he composed them all himself. He had to translate it, which means he adjusted how the guitar plays for them uh, to match, you know, uh, German vocabulary. It's a very beautiful moment. So I just gave him credit uh, as getting on the 16 seed for that. He, he, you're right. He, there are characters that are just kind of uh, not forgotten, but just don't serve any real. They're quote unquote. The crew. Exactly. They're a the cameraman's they're a good collective one. collective character. There's other characters who are just in there for very much comedic beats. One of the jokes that has always rubbed me a little wrong is the, the crew member, the female crew member who's just always topless. Yeah, I didn't get that. I was like, I, I, I might have missed it. I was like, was there a reason for that? Or was it? Just no, cause... I think the gag is that she's always topless and she's European. And I think the I think what it's supposed to be meaning is that Steve just likes her on the boat because she's always topless. Yeah, I think because he has yeah. a womanizing tendencies. Yeah, I thought that was... that's a joke where I'm just like, 
I I don't know if that should have stayed in the movie. And I think again, where we talked about last week with Rushmore, where some things just end up getting cut just due to time. That's a joke that I don't think makes it in in twenty twenties. No, where it's just not. like I like the joke is like kind of funny, but it's not enough of a payoff to actually really go anywhere with it. Yeah, because they don't really make a joke about it. It was just like she's currently topless. Yes, yeah, and other that's her only she's real not. role like, in the film. Like, it is her simply being topless in one scene to another. And it's not even like it's like she's in the whole film with the crew and the joke is like every scene and she's kind of a main character. She's topless. It's like, oh, no, we're just going to cut back to this character who's just randomly topless. Yeah, because she wasn't. Yeah, she had clothes on for most of the film. Yeah, like, that was. So it was yeah, just really, was, it was just, it felt weirdly out of place. If no, else. I totally agree. I like, had that same issue when I watched it. I remember just thinking, like, that's not, I wouldn't call that sexist, but it feels borderline uncomfortable sexist, where it's just like, I don't think there's any intent there. Definitely um, rugged, rubbed me the wrong way. Just a little yeah. bit like a, I don't know. I was just like, this doesn't need to be here, you know? <laughs> like, it's sometimes the argument made for if you had let somebody else. Uh, write specifically it, if, a woman yeah writer. or a woman <laughs> maybe be? editing that's probably a choice that is cut out which i'm actually glad i mentioned that point because i was very much about to forget this movie this point this is the longest wes anderson movie yeah i was surprised it was a full minutes. two hours because i was promised hour and a half movies for this <laughs> can i tell you i love that his longest movie is only an hour 58 what, what a beautiful runtime i talk about it all the time and it's i it's something that has changed with me in the past two years. Two thousand nine's Avatar does not need to be two hours and forty five minutes long. It's not that long, is it? Avatar? It was like yeah, two is hours. It actually it was like two and a half to two and forty five. It was oh my ridiculous. God. It was ugh, There are very few movies that deserve to be three hours long. I will give the Godfather credit. I will give Gandhi credit. I'll even give more recent examples like Avengers Endgame and the Bat man credit for being long though i did say the batman should be edited a little bit what th- i th- i know you don't watch as many films as i do as someone who's been reviewing films a lot more the past two years it's just like movies that start getting to two and a half hours you're Ended. just like okay yeah it's just like can we speed this up like i've got to go pick where, up my kids from soccer practice yeah when when i was just watching like maybe a few f- f- films casually every few weeks it's like oh okay two and a half hours that's not that bad when i'm watching like a film maybe every other day i'm just like why can't you be like a tight two hours and that's where i've gone way more critical on editing i'm just like no come on let's just end this come on just cut you this don't out really it need doesn't this beat. need to be here <laughs> but i do appreciate that even on the longest of wes anderson films it's still less than two hours that's yeah, still, it's still a, very a reasonable doable. amount of time and they give this movie enough where there's not anything there are like i said with like that joke that we just said there are scenes that i would cut there aren't like sequences i would cut which is a good indication that i think it's fairly well edited where there's not like a sequence that happens where i'm just like did this really need to be in the movie there are some sequences that maybe play a little bit wtf like what's going on right now but they were very funny and I, or, you know the segment I'm talking about, right? When I say WTF, what's going on right now? Uh, could you? It's the pirate gag. Here? Oh it's yeah, the, <laughs> okay. The pirate gag is so random in the film, and unlike the scene with the topless girl, which I just said was a little needless, this one I'm not necessarily sure if it's necessary in the movie. But the gag is so funny. Well, yeah, but also it had the it actually had consequences and it was followed through for the rest of the film. Like it. Good point. So that, good point. So that was like an actual. It was a. It was part of the movie. It wasn't just a throwaway gag or a scene. And I like throwaway oh. gags personally. They're some of the best parts of the entire movie for me. Like the name. The names of the random fish were so good. <laughs> The gag that killed me in this movie, and I was audibly laughing during the scene, and it's probably the hardest I've ever laughed at a Wes Anderson film, at least for the past three that we've watched. When Steve Zissou has the gun, 
and he's just yeah. kind of <laughs> shooting it aimlessly. And then you see the pirates firing back, and he's not even bothering to dodge. All the bullets are just yeah, missing just him, like, <laughs> like hitting around his shoulders. I was like, I'm man, like, he really is, is the so... main character. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, this is such plot device, but it's so jokingly in your face plot device that it's totally hysterical. Yeah, I thought I make turning crying. Bill Murray into a badass was hilarious and Yeah, because he doesn't even shoot the gun well. No. He's just kind of shooting it straight out. I like, thought the guns in general were kind of just a neat, funny little gag. Like the when he's handing Ned one, he's like, "Oh, no thank you." And then he's like, "Come on, everyone has one, even the interns." And then um you cut to Anne Marie and she's just like, "We all share one." <laughs> <laughs> I think there's like a moment in it specifically, and it's mixed with, uh, I'm going to try pronouncing his name correct, Mark Mothersbaugh's music, where there's the scene where they're captured by the pirates, and Steve Zissou's like, all right, it's time to actually do something, and he just bites off the rope that is being held, yeah. and he just takes them out like John Wick style. Yeah, he and just my rips, favorite he thing, hulks out and just you never actually them. see in that scene him actually like land a shot. Yeah, I like, know. you can actually clearly see the bullets missing. And then there'll just be a random character who just falls. <laughs> yeah, and then, um, I like, well, he did land a shot on that dude with the machete, and then it just went to that intern's shoulder. And I thought it was really <laughs> funny that when all the interns left, he's the one that decided to stay. <laughs> he was the like, ah, intern, what else could happen? <laughs> that intern, because he's the unpaid intern, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is Noah Baumbach, who, uh, director of, of Marriage Story slash the co-writer of this film. That gag with the interns is hysterical throughout where he's just – I love where he's just like, uh, well, you're uh, you're not going to get your credits <laughs> if you leave now. You're all getting incompletes. This sucks. The, <laughs> yeah, and then where the unpaid intern like does something well and he's like, you are definitely getting an A. <laughs> Yeah, like that was when the like, guy decided to stay. He's like, I thought you all left. He's like, ah, I decided to stay. You're definitely <laughs> getting an A. There's so many moments in that where I'm just like, that's really good comedic beats. And this is, to me, one of the funnier Wes Anderson films. I think, personally, from what I've remembered, and I need to see all the films again, which we'll be doing in the next few weeks, Fantastic Mr. Fox always stands out as maybe the funniest film to me. This one competes in its moments throughout because it's not only that. There are other occurrences where the the whole demeanor of Jeff Goldblum in this movie is really funny. I just love where the scene where he's like, oh, we're coming to rescue. And he's in this like all white loose like <laughs> suit jacket and he's got like the scarf and he just has flip flops on it. And he's like, Steve, is that you? Are you coming to rescue me? Mm. <laughs> yeah just the whole demeanor with him and then like the fact where steve is like oh we stole all of his equipment kit like covers and then How later you guys on get my cappuccino maker <laughs> my espresso <laughs> maker like... we stole it <laughs> <laughs> there's moments throughout with those characters where i'm like i'm like that's a really good supporting character and i mean jeff goldblum is always going to do that when you bring him on to a movie there is one thing that jeff goldblum is and that is entertaining to watch. Even in like his worst movies, he is always a delight to just see in movies. And he fits so well with the tone of Wes Anderson, where they complement each other so perfectly, where Goldblum can play on those eccentric – oh, my God, I keep mispronouncing that, ner- that word – eccentric moments, where – Anderson can mix that with his whimsical humor and it makes for this really entertaining just like character. Same with Willem Dafoe, who I think at this point isn't really known as a good comedic actor. He kills every comedic beat he is given throughout this film. I'd down agree. to down to just the pose where he's kneeling in the red shorts and he's like posing like he's uh he's like doing a squat. And he's just staring intensely into the camera. That was, I think that's a Willem Dafoe idea, uh, if I've read that correctly. Where Willem Dafoe had the idea of, he's like, my character should be in red shorts the whole movie. And they were like, all right, let's go for it. Sick. Go for it. (laughs) That's just, that's a moment where it's just like you're allowing an actor to just know that character. Uh, 
speaking of characters, and I do want to jump back into the movie because I've gone a little sidetracked as I usually do. I really like what Owen Wilson does in this movie. Like, oh yeah, very much enjoy it. That uh, was incredibly he, likable. He is not a typical Owen Wilson character where it doesn't feel like he gets the comedic beats in this movie. He is very much just the genuine, kind-hearted individual who is funny because it's Owen Wilson, but it's not like he is the joke in the movie and he's getting the hardest laughs. He allows himself as a performer to be a little bit more passive and just be along for the ride. And his whole thing with doing this is he just simply wants to know his dad, Steve. Oh, yeah. His whole motivation was that he's like, you know, his mother passed away or took her own life. And he was just like, this is a part of my life that's been here forever. I should act on this. It's finally mm -hmm. time. And yeah. he didn't get what he signed up for. Yeah. He didn't get the guy that he wanted. And it's yeah, sad. Yeah, there's, there's uh, Wes Anderson on the Criterion Collection, the commentary. He talks about how he drew inspiration from uh, other books, obviously one being Moby Dick, the other one being The Great Gatsby. And I think there is definitely a similarity with Owen Wilson's character of Nick, where he's an outsider now in this culture that is so foreign and weird. And specifically the guy he idolizes in Great Gatsby, that being Jay Gatsby, in this film it being Steve Zissou, where both of those characters are very cold, they're very lonely individuals who are struggling to make real human connections. And then when they do, they start getting scared and a little passive, and maybe even to a degree de aggressive. I like that they drew inspiration from that because I think that allows the... Well, here's the thing. I mean, Great, Great Gatsby, very famous book, and it worked. If, if you can draw inspiration off an idea that already works, it builds a lot to those characters where it's just like, oh, no, the, some of those emotional beats are just help when you're paying homage to something because you kind of know those character arcs hitting throughout. I like that Steve Zissou is very hard to deal with when he now meets his son. What do you mean? What I mean by that is there is a level to him that is just unintentionally cold. And there's also a bit of him that's also trying to be welcoming because he realizes it's his son. But he also wants to keep the distance. There's that one line that he has in the middle of the film where uh, Ned asked about something about their relationship. And he's like, I never wanted a son. I ne or not even I never wanted a son. I never wanted to be a father. Right. Point blank. Like, it's moments like that where it's just like the character is trying so hard to create a line in the sand between him and Ned. But he's doing it out of more protection for himself, Steve, Steve is, where it's just like maybe he's starting to sense that he's being drawn into Ned and he has to create a distance. I think that's very similar at times with Jay Gatsby where there's moments in the book where Nick starts talking to Jay and there's things revealed about Jay Gatsby that start to scare Jay because he's only known this party life and it's covering for such pain and darkness in his own life that – Jay at times in the books, from what I recall, and I apologize, it's been a few years. It's there's quite moments a few years the, for me. Yeah, quite a f I think it's been, I think I read it sometime in college again. But it's been moments in that where it is, again, that line in the sand where it's like, okay, there has to be boundaries here because admitting this to Nick is admitting something about myself that I don't want to admit. And in the case of this movie, it's Steve having to admit, I was a shitty father. Uh, yeah. Another thing, though, is um, I thought that in hindsight that I never wanted to be a father line kind of related to like because you find out later that he's been sterile the whole time. So he's known that um, that Ned isn't his son. But just because he didn't want to be a father, you know, this is going to sound weird, but it doesn't mean he didn't want a son. I think yeah. he was he's rejecting the fact because he couldn't he couldn't have one. I think he's rejecting the fact that he ever wanted one. And uh, does, what was sorry, what was saying? Sorry to pause you on that thought. Does he know he's sterile, or is that something that only uh, 
Mrs. Tenenbaum knows. No, I wasn't uh, clear if she Eleanor, knew. Not El- sorry. Yeah, Mrs. <laughs> yeah, it was crap. Eleanor uh, Zissou. Is that something he knows? Unconfirmed. I d- they never. I don't think they addressed it after that. I think it was a. Uh, well, maybe he doesn't. Maybe it's just open for blames, interpretation. He blames it on her that she's uh, at the age of thirty four. She's too oh, old yeah. to have a child. Yeah, and then so he said, I didn't. Yeah, I was having trouble with that because I thought the same thing when that lines revealed at the very end, where it's just like he's shooting blanks. I'm like, does he know that? And I. Th- I don't know. I actually do not know. That was one of the things where I was trying to just think of all the moments in the film. And there's never a time where they actually confirm that one he knows or that's something that was even disclosed to him. I'm kind of thinking in my personal feeling, I feel like Angelica Houston's character, Eleanor, keeps that from him. I thought maybe again, it's I could be wrong. I I think it was unconfirmed. I am very, very, very probably wrong. But um what was it uh i thought he when ned came into his life and they were talking about you know ned's mother and all that something clicked inside steve where he was like i finally have my opportunity because we were talking about how his life is starting to you know chapters in his life have been closing and he Mm -hmm. never got to access that so i think he kind of just jumped on it and kept playing with that and i think the whole um can i call you dad line and he's like you can call me uh what was it stevie mm-hmm. um i think that was him just being like yeah i i know i'm not your dad that's actually a really good argument because it's the thing that like he can't have him call him dad because he knows it's not true that's a really good argument against i it's definitely left for interpretation i feel unless they're unless we're just both yeah, we could just in the movie where they just like, honestly. yeah but i don't recall anything like that because i was actually looking out for that because that was one of the plot points i did remember that he's not actually his biological son in the movie there is a character introduced in the movie that i was a little mixed with but ultimately was in favor of simply because of the performance the actress gave into the movie Mm -hmm. and that is jane winslet richardson what kate blanchett does in this movie is really special because i don't think her character actually gets a lot to do and i think it could have come off as maybe a bit the character could have just come off as maybe another lackluster female character in Anderson's kind of filmography where it's just like, maybe he sometimes struggles on it. This character is not that. And I think it's actually kind of played more solely because of how good Kate Blanchett is versus the writing of this film. Uh, I think the relationship that she has with Ned is really sweet. Super endearing. Yeah. And, Allowing that to be the case allows this character to be much more likable. And the fact that she gets to be a little bit harder with Bill Murray's character, Steve, allows her to kind of have this pushback. And a lot of that becomes in just the way she delivers it. She's playing it a little bit more harsh in scenes where I think maybe another actress or had it gone maybe just reading it exactly how the script had done it. I think some of those lines could come off maybe a little bit passive or more playful. She does it as like, you are kind of a piece of crap and I'm not really impressed by you. And she comes from a place of like, you were my hero as a kid and you are just the ultimate failure. Yeah, she she, she just like Ned, which kind of brought them together, is that they didn't find who they were looking for. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the same dude. But they both have different like ideas of who Steve is. Where Yeah, yeah. Well, she's I mean, disappointed in the man that Steve is not. And Owen Wilson's character is so looking for a father figure that he embraces Steve for who he is and like loses that pers- persona of the star that Steve is where Kate Blanchett is like this guy's just the most pathetic i love the scene where she's like you know i had your poster on his kid and he like does the pose Mm -hmm. you know the pointing and he's just like that was a long time ago like that's never been me i forgot exactly what the line is but it's moments like that where you just like felt like that it was something yeah there's yeah yeah there's just actual devastation in her where she's just like she's the one 
seeing somebody that probably inspired her so much as a, a child. Yeah. Now seeing it and just being like, this guy's an asshole. Yeah. They, they always say you should never meet your heroes. Yeah. It, that's what this, this case is in this movie. Let's jump over a little bit towards the end of the movie, because I think this is where I want to pay the most attention as we close out. The end of this movie is endearingly heartwarming in a really sad way. Yeah, it's very bittersweet. It's extremely bittersweet. The the death of Owen Wilson's character, Ned, happens really quick in this movie. Yeah, because there's not like, really an indication. There's he he just again helicopter crashes and he has a few lines and boom they're, they're throwing yeah. his casket in the ocean. It's this moment with these with I think with Steve's character, it's almost this idea of like everything bad happens to the people around him and he doesn't suffer the consequences. This is the first case where he feels I think the consequences like the most like most with him but it's still a consequence that happens because it's his own fault one it's his uh ego for never just repairing the ships and doing unsafe like practices two it's also just his unhinged revenge to chase down a shark after the fact that they escaped from pirates and like we're already like all right we should have had the adventure for the day we need to get everybody back safe like there there was definitely a point and they say it in the movie where it's like you're going this is a suicide mission yep and steve doesn't mind that because maybe to some degree he is suicidal himself where it's just like it doesn't matter if this is my end because it, that this is what it is yeah and what this else is, is the there? only thing i know with this scene though when he does just end up dying from his injuries it is a very quick scene where it's just like it just happens like you don't even realize like when they're in the water together you don't see any indication that Ned's like supremely like injured or anything. You just think they're about to get out and they just had this helicopter crash. And it's this another like vignette in the movie when he pulls him off sea and then he just like kind of dies. You're just like, there's no closure. There's no final words really said. It's just simply like they lost each other. Yeah. I mean, all of the red in the water um, was certainly leading me to believe like, okay, this, they, they just killed Ned but also, I was thinking, like, would they really do that? Would they exactly. really do that? And then they did. And I was like, uh, uh, mm, mm. Yeah, you're right. The the red is a good point for the indication that they did. I When I watched it again, I did, like, remember. Th- I, I knew it was happening because I'm like, okay, I do actually kind of remember Owen Wilson's character dying. It was a scene where I'm like, is this actually where he dies in the movie? Because there's not a great indication uh, the blood is starting to show it, but it's still like, I think what sells it so much is Owen Wilson seems very normal in this scene. Mm-hmm. Like, it's yeah. not like he's gasping for breath or like in real pain. It's just kind of, I'd like, so I think you can surmount the blood to that scene and just like, Oh, he's slightly injured. Cause a plane just crashed. Yeah. yeah no, you're supposed to have doubt. That's what makes yeah. the literally the scene, like just cutting to the funeral. It really just, hit. You're just like, Oh, it, no, that happened devastating there is no coming back from that that happened and i think what takes this movie from where i'm still like a little mixed on the movie to where i'm like okay i get the point of this movie and i really like this movie is the scene where they go under in the submarine to find the shark Mm -hmm. this is the scene in the movie that actually makes the movie for me and if this scene is done any lesser not only does the movie take away that like specialness for me I also just don't think the movie's good without this scene. I think this scene contextualizes so much of what happens earlier in the film. And it finally allows us to just break down with Steve Zissou's character. Because it's just this scene where he comes face to face with the shark. Mm -hmm. And the shark's so huge. And they're like, so you're going to kill the shark? And he's like, no. One, we don't have the dynamite. Yeah. And true, I'm just, I'm just not. And it's this moment where he just gets to stare out and he starts sobbing. Just And the whole crew just gets to embrace him, basically saying, like, we forgive you. And it's a really poignant 
scene in the movie like just absolutely jaw-dropping beautiful scene absolutely i completely agree with that i don't have much to add on it but i do (laughs) completely agree i what works so well about it is at least for me when i'm watching the scene like it 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 allows the character to just move on and find peace in his life where it's no longer he's being fueled by revenge his ego just uh wanting to prove something to himself it is simply like i've lost and i want to move on and find peace with this loss and make amends and it's that moment where i'm just like this is a really beautiful touching point in the movie and it works so beautifully for me just because this is to me this might be bill murray's best acting in his career in this one singular scene because there's no lines giving it's just him staring out kind of reminiscing on everything he's lost and everything that he's done his legacy his life and everybody that he's hurt and basically everybody that he's really hurt is in that boat with him from his wife that he's now uh basically estranged from uh to some of his crewmates that he's kind of just gone to abuse throughout the years, to his arch nemesis, all a star to the female journalist who was also Ned Plimpton's, you know, love interest in the movie slash lover. It's all of those characters just getting to be there in that moment, kind of just getting to forgive. And it's a message of acceptance moving forward. And it's a really beautiful scene because it's just like, no, we as humans are allowed to evolve and we never stop growing. And just because we're terrible one day doesn't mean that that's who we are for the rest of our lives. Even at the age of 50, yeah, we're th- still allowed to find healing. Yeah, I think uh, another line that captures that sentiment is when he uh, said, I haven't been at my best for the last decade. Mm-hmm. Which means like, man, time really does fly. The fact that he said decade instead of like year or like since some event, he said for 10 years... I have not been a good person. Yeah, it, like, it is that like for that, but he's just like it's that timelessness, right? Of it, where it's just like wow, it's like one day goes by, and then in the next second, it's ten years, yeah. and it's just like this is who I've been for the past decade. Yeah, and he's kind of he admits it to himself, and again, he continues, like you said, moving forward. And I think that's just a, I think that's a great message for any movie. Mm-hmm. I agree. I love the how this movie ends. And then the movie uh, takes on a very, uh, I wouldn't call it meta, but the movie ends literally on a beat that is supposed to almost be a fabric of reality. It's where all the main characters get to be back in the movie. Uh, Steve Zissou is literally walking with his son on his shoulders, Ned Plimpton on his shoulders as a child just it's this movie it's this moment like the movie nine and a half by oh my gosh why am i blanking on the director but it's this is this motif that some directors use where it's just like you bring back the whole ensemble for this final scene uh this is actually very common in place too where all the main characters even if they have died where it's just like oh they're all on stage one last time kind of getting to move on and end the show Mm -hmm. that's what this movie does like in a very literal sense where it's just like The show ends, the movie ends, like the Steve Zissou documentary that plays ends, and all these characters kind of just walk forward together going back onto the boat. It's a very, I think the word would be meta, I guess, in my opinion, but it's also just a moment that just feels deserved, and it's maybe the start of you seeing Steve healing. Those are my thoughts on the life aquatic of Steve Zissou. Uh, I'm trying to think if there was any characters that I did not really play attention to. One that I will just mention is because he's always a delight to see as an actor. I like Michael Gambon in this movie, who, of course, plays Dumbledore. And I think this is the same year he starts playing Dumbledore in the Harry Potter movies with Prisoner of Azkaban. But him as the guy basically financing Bill Murray's project in this movie. Oh, yeah. I liked him. He's really good. He has a very great voice. Uh, that is all. Voice. That is all I am going to really talk about in this movie. And those are my kind of just final thoughts. I think it's a really well done movie. Oh, you did want to talk about the puppets in this movie. Just puppets. real quick. Because not the puppets. Sorry, not the puppets. The what is it oh, called? The animals. The, the animals. 
the motion capture animal. Are they motion capture? It's claymation. What are they? <laughs> claymation. You you had mentioned the point, so I wanted to just let you hit on oh, that. Before I, I we think leave. I already. I think I mostly said what I had to say. It's just that they were so visually striking and really fun, and it was just a cool little world that these people inhabited. That um, what was it? It wasn't the aurora borealis. It was some colorful ring in the sky. Oh, I don't where they're like the was. sky flips upside down. Yeah, it was. Just, I think it's what Willem Dafoe says. Yeah, it was just cool, and it was just again. I loved how colorful and bright this movie is, and I loved this little magical world that the ocean in which they inhabited. I loved all the contrasting colors, so everything, everyone popped. It was just Agreed. fun to look at. Agreed. I love the costuming look. I wish Adidas actually released that tracksuit. Yeah, that would, yeah. that would be a really awesome outfit. Like just <laughs> that's a that's a fit right there. You should go for you should go as the as kids a, say. You go as Steve for Halloween. I could, I could. I have the glasses already. Yeah, all you need is a beanie. I was trying to find before, as I have a red beanie somewhere, and I could not find it today. So I just had to just go with a beanie just to cover my hair. But I have a red beanie that looks exactly like it does in the movie. Yeah. The, Listeners, the, please recommend me and Ben Halloween costumes. It is currently yeah. March. <laughs> the The scene that you're talking about with the animals, at the end I thought it looked a little too absurdist like I just when that, they're all though. going i know i, I, I it was a choice that i just didn't fully connect with until the jaguar shark comes on screen when the jaguar shark comes on screen with like this ridiculous kind of glow in the yeah the luminescent and, scales like and all and that, that i'm like okay no i actually like this creative choice right here where it's just something so divinely beautiful it almost feels like yeah i think that's a beautiful way of putting it it's like seeing a dragon yeah where it's just so mythical and it it kind of brings you weirdly by seeing something so exotic and so different and so weird it almost brings you back to reality where it's just like oh this is kind of our place in the world and like we get to like live on this world and coexist with creatures like this and this world is so much more than just me uh, the center of me, like this world has so many beauties of it, this creature being one, how could I even think of killing this animal that just gets to inhabit the earth with us? I think yeah. it's a really peaceful like scene. So I like that, and I, like I said, I really like this movie. Jalal, are you ready for the to end the show with our... Oh, are we doing are you it ready? now? Shall we? Are you ready for the so great... great. The great... Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Great Debate. I am your host, Ben Friedman. As always, we have prepared a question for each other. Jalal has a question for me. I have a question for him. We're going to duke it out, see who has the best answer, and then we'll just briefly hit on some of the March Madness stuff before we go on. But with that all said, Jalal, I'll let you go first with your question. All right, all right, all right. So let's say that instead of a crew... Bill Murray works with the Muppets to try to find the Jaguar Sharks. Mm-hmm. How does the movie change? How does it change? Great question. Great question. Funny enough is some of the... I don't actually know if the film changes. Some yeah, of these characters are too. so <laughs> cartoonish that like, you're telling me you can't see Gonzo as... Uh, uh, Willem Dafoe's character. No, yeah. like, you totally could. Same yeah. with like, tell me you don't put Sam the Eagle as Jeff Goldblum in there. <laughs> uh, I obviously I think you'd have as the captain. Who would be? No, I guess Steve Zissou would still be the captain. Yeah, I, so who I, would I, play I want his son? Bill Murray to play off the Muppets. I would have Scooter play his son. I was just thinking Kermit. <laughs> oh, you're right. Kermit should be the son, just... but then Kermit has to die. Oh wait. <laughs> well, I can't have. have you seen that video of like Kermit falling out of a oh. window? <laughs> yeah, I can't. I can't have Kermit die in line. So I guess I just have to kill off Scooter. Good point. Good. Oh, uh, why are we? <laughs> Never oh, mind. I no. regret this question now. Kermit. Who would Kermit be in this movie? Kermit would probably be. Oh, it would actually kind of be funny if Kermit plays Michael Gambon's character, who's just like the one producing this movie for Steve <laughs> Zissou and the Muppets to go on. He's like, wait, what? <laughs> like. Just like you're doing what with my money? <laughs> like all this like fifty million like pirates. All that. I think that would actually be a pretty funny dynamic. I think where the movie takes its most 
drastic change. No, I can't even say drastic because I'm now like. Uh, I think it's pretty similar. I actually <laughs> think it's really similar. Like weirdly enough, it like, fits in you're pretty well me... with the. It leads into the claymation animals. It's just like an extra step. Yeah, you're telling me the Bill Murray together. couldn't mourn a Muppet. Oh, he absolutely could. The only scene that would be like, oh, uh, would would question for you when the pirates come on? Would they be humans or are they Muppets? I was thinking humans. <laughs> It would be kind of really funny if they're actually Muppets, and like when they get shot, you just see the stuffing. Like, yeah, stuffing. <laughs> yeah. So you know, weirdly, Jalal, I I know why you thought of this question, just because due to the animals at the end, it totally makes sense. Uh, I'm going with the fact that this movie does not change with Muppets in place. You and I are in the same place on that one. Yes. Okay. Okay. There is one change, and it might be for the better. There's no topless Muppet in this movie. Oh, dang so it. A... <laughs> <laughs> though I right, kind right, of right. would like to change the answer, though, to just I would keep Willem Dafoe <laughs> in the movie. How about a and Willem have Dafoe him Muppet? interact? Like a, what was that? How about a Willem Dafoe Muppet? No, I want Willem Dafoe as Willem, like as he looks now, or I guess as he looked in 2004, interacting with a bunch of Muppets and not treating it any differently. <laughs> like, I think that would be really funny. But anyway, that's my answer. Jalal, my question for you is what other vessel would you put the cast of Life Aquatic on for, let's say they did a sequel. What other vessel would you want to reimagine them on? Hmm. I'm going to go for another, I guess it's kind of seafaring vessel. Okay. I want them to be in the paddy wagon from the SpongeBob movie. Ooh, the paddy wagon. I know it's you don't a little need a small to fit to like eleven people. Paddy. I know it's like a little small, well, but they, I feel Steve like Steve could upgrade it. Yeah, exactly. You could make they, a wider paddy. Exactly, you can make a Krabby Patty Deluxe <laughs> with cheese, Mister Squidward. With, with cheese. cheese. Yeah, just throw everyone in there and uh, have them cram in. I think it would be a hilarious little thing. I, I like to imagine the denizens of Bikini Bottom are right under <laughs> where the entirety of the movie is taking place. But I think you get to actually have Bikini a Bottom is in the Pacific Ocean. They're like in the Mediter- They're off the coast Mediterranean. of Italy. So you get to have a moment though where they all like at the end where they're all just crammed in that submarine, staring out. Imagine that on a patty. Mm. That's Make just me nice. Does the uh, what type of adventure are they going on if they are on a Krabby Patty? To uh, get car? Neptune's crown, obviously. Oh, so you're just remaking? Are you? Is your pitch for the Life Aquatic of Steve Zissou Chu just the SpongeBob SquarePants movie live action? I think that would be great. <laughs> I don't hate the idea. My answer is maybe terrible compared to this, and now I'm regretting about to say it. Uh, the, the Titanic was bus. a horrible yeah. event. <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, no, the Titanic killed like 1500 people it's pretty tragic imagine Steve Zissou getting that team out with his uh, he'd shoot the iceberg he would shoot ever, the iceberg <laughs> before it and ever, he'd miss <laughs> he would miss but the iceberg would go away it just like melt the iceberg just, is like, also claymation it just gets up and walks away <laughs> it would be such a I, 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 can I even pitch this movie? Am I even allowed to pitch this type of movie? To Wes it Anderson, it probably be, works. It would literally just be the film Life Aquatic of Steve Zissou, which just on a really big boat and just getting to get the elegance of the Titanic on there. Kind of think of the scenes where we're in Italy in the film festivals, which, by the way, is such a ridiculous idea. Even for like Italy's filmmaking standards, the idea that they're still showing oceanography to like red carpets and all this i'm like (laughs) even in like the biggest of like filmographies and like european cinema that's not something that gets played at film festivals definitely not the one where all the press is there of steve zisu yeah that's that's not happening but in this movie you get to have that type of like elegance lifestyle extravaganza on the boat so you get to see steve zisu here's my pitch bill murray uh, was the original choice to play Batman in 1989's Tim Burton Batman, you get to see Steve Zissou balance kind of that persona where he is Steve Zissou and he's then Steve Zissou in the public eye, which is a very different Steve Zissou that we get to see. We get to see those power 
shifts and dynamics change throughout the film. So my pitch is Steve Zissou is on the Titanic and he saves the crew. I think he's they're saved gonna they're everyone. gonna time travel. Yeah, they're gonna time travel in my in my pick. Uh, we're bringing so, time travel into this now, man. Yeah, dude. Listen, <laughs> I don't Wes think Anderson sell this has a Wes Anderson has a dark sense of humor, and there might be a funny movie with the Titanic involved. <laughs> oh no! And that's that's have the we, end of my. Have we locked ourselves show. into this now? Yeah, uh, I guess it's gonna be Branson and you hosting a show from now on. Uh, I'm down. I, will be, I will be in Titanic reform uh, therapy for the next few weeks. You, no, you so, probably uh, you're making this movie. You'll probably be in it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I'll uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll fill in for you for the rest of I'll the. I'll be time. Gonzo. I'll yeah, be Gonzo go. as Willem Dafoe. There you go. All right, that is our pitches for the Wild Wild West Life Aquatic Edition. Before we leave, I just want to mention a few matchups real quick. Before we leave, Jalal, if you would not mind in indulging me. Ugh. I know, I know. I, I always ask the worst of you. Besides Steve Zissou in this movie, is there any character that you think could actually make a legitimate run in this tournament? Uh Again, this is kind of just not going on matchups because I know you still haven't seen a few of the Anderson movies, but just based on like your instinct where you're like, this character I feel like is going to really hit the pulse yeah. of an audience. They could really make it for two of further. them. Uh, okay. Ned and um, Klaus. Okay. Klaus is my answer too. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's just enough of Willem Dafoe love that people are going to just power Klaus through a lot of the rounds. Now, he has a tough matchup where he is pl- facing off against the character of Simone in the French Dispatch, which maybe it's not that tough of a matchup. Maybe it's just because that's one of my favorite segments in the French Dispatch is with uh, Leia's character, Simone. But regardless, even if he makes it through, he will have to be facing uh, either Nutmeg from Isle of Dogs, which is voiced by Scarlett Johansson, or Anthony Adams, who is Luke Wilson's character in Bottle Rocket. So he might have a tough time, but I agree. I think just the iconic look of uh, of Willem Dafoe in this movie is enough to power him through a lot. There's a lot, a lot of things that those shorts can't do for a man. Oh, and yeah. that may I be enough to get you in the Sweet Sixteen. Then we get we get in each other those shorts and then going out on the town. Dude, if we went out in the Life Aquatic uh, Willem Dafoe outfit, like. From the beanie to the shorts to the shoes, we are going to have a good night out in Sacramento. It'll it'll be something to remember. I'll tell you yeah, that much. We are going to be crawling with women. I don't think that'll <laughs> happen personally, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, maybe we should give yeah. this a shot. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But uh, so I'm meeting you downtown in a few hours, correct? Uh, you get your red short shorts on. All right, I'm on it. All right, so we got to go to find some red short shorts, guys. So. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next week. Oh, I Tune did want to announce. next time to Jalal and Bran see a movie. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to announce that I am recording the Moonrise Kingdom episode with Mr. Jeff Snyder uh, from Ankler, formerly from Collider, film reporter, a journalist. Very excited to be talking to him. Moonrise Kingdom, I know he's a fan of that movie, so can't wait to talk about that. Jalal and I will be back soon for... I believe it's Darjeeling Limited next is our next movie. Very excited. Tune in for that Friday. And thanks for listening, guys. Take care.